Mom rage is intense. It's probably one of the scariest emotions that I have ever battled with. And I remember at one point asking myself, why can't I stop? I mean, gosh, I loved my babies more than anything in this world. And I wondered, why am I yelling at them? Now, if you've thought this and you're currently feeling stuck and like you're needing understanding and clarity for why you can't stop raging, I want you to know that you are in the right place. Today, I'm going to be sharing my personal struggles with mom rage, how I discovered what was triggering me, and that I may have been at a bit of a disadvantage because of a gene mutation. Although your story may look different, I hope that this episode encourages you to find the answers that you've been so desperately searching for. Welcome to the Slowish Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Alexis. I'm a mama to two little girls and a parenting coach. It's become my mission to help families rekindle connection, to rebuild relationships on a foundation of safety and trust, and to give parents the tools they need to show up with empathy and compassion, no matter what situation may arise. If you are craving slowness, peace, Enjoy in your parenting. You've come to the right place. Alrighty, let's get into today's episode. Hello, you guys. Welcome back to another episode of the Slowish Parenting Podcast. I am so glad to have you guys here. Today, we're talking about something that is very near and dear to my heart and something that, if I'm honest, I still struggle with from time to time. Uh, I feel like mom rage is a journey. It's not something that we just are able to figure out what our trigger is or or discover, you know, why we're raging and just be able to turn the leaf and, and move on. And it's interesting. What actually prompted me to to start this podcast episode or to to record it rather was an email that I received from a listener and she was just venting about how frustrated she was with herself for mom rage and at the end I don't think she intended it as a question to like actually ask me like why can't I stop I think it was more out of like anger and frustration like why can't I stop this but it really had me thinking you know why can't I stop raging why can't I I know all the things I'm watching all the things I'm researching all the things I'm doing all the things but rage keeps coming up and why and so that was really what inspired this podcast episode and I want you to know it's not a simple answer it's not just a simple yeah these are all the reasons why you're continuing to rage your story is unique and it's unique for a purpose and for a reason and I believe that these are the things that lead us to helping others in the future you know if I hadn't dealt with mom rage I wouldn't be able to talk to you I wouldn't be able to be on this podcast episode because I'd have no business being here I wouldn't understand what it's like to be in your shoes but now I get to I get to be here and I get to talk with you and I get to encourage you and I hope you know today's episode is more of a a (laughs) soft encouraging place that you land. I hope this is maybe an episode that you come back to a time or two to feel like there is hope and there is a reason why you are raging still. And I think that each point that I'm going to be sharing today is kind of like a jumping point and maybe some things you're going to actually take and you're just going to pin it on your wall (laughs) literally like you're just gonna pin it on your wall you're just curious you're not exactly sure what that means or what that's gonna look like for you or how this integrates into your life but you're curious about it and I think when we can come from a place of curiosity versus criticism and harshness towards ourselves we actually start to free ourselves from that that anger and that rage that ultimately comes up because we don't know how to handle it We don't know how to to deal with the feelings. They're uncomfortable. It's hard. It's also scary. You know, for me, it was scary that I was home with my two babies all by myself. And what if I rage? What if I get so angry that I yell? 
you know? What, what if I yell at my toddlers? That was a really scary thought for me. I did not want to yell. I did not want to scream. I did not want to be that person because I knew they didn't deserve that. That's the hard part about mom rage. We can love our kids so much, right? So incredibly much. Like we would, I would throw my life down for my kids. And yet, why am I getting so angry? Why am I feeling like this visceral response? And so much of what I've learned about, um, I've learned, you know, about with anger is really from Irene Lyon and her talking about healthy aggression and how a lot of times this rage is really just a suppression of what we suppressed years and years and years ago coming up in a very similar situation, which I think has a lot to do with my rage and my story, which I will touch on in a bit uh, because I, I think it is an important part to hear how how it integrates for me and kind of my story with it and and what that looks like I think story is really helpful in uh, helping our minds to understand what's actually going on and how we can make the make the path forward and sometimes it's easier said than done (laughs) sometimes it takes a lot of work and a lot of uh, questioning and asking and being very curious uh, about ourselves and, and being in a place where we're not hypercritical. We're just, we're just curious, you know, we're just trying to understand. So I hope that that sets up this podcast episode and, and it makes you feel safe. It makes you feel understood and it makes you feel seen and heard and all of the things that you are so lacking right now and so needing at the very same time. So the first thing that I really was thinking about when this mom had messaged me and said, why can't I stop, was the suppressed emotions, which is, you know, what I just mentioned and talked about. Uh, But I I think that (laughs) I hear this so often in my coaching, you know, yeah, but I didn't have big trauma. Like I didn't, I didn't really have trauma. And I think that it's so easy for us to look at other people's lives and say, yeah, but they had it worse. You know, they had really big trauma. And I just want to invite you to lose the thought of big trauma, little trauma. Trauma is trauma. And everybody's experience gets to be their experience and it's not right or wrong. Uh, You can have the same experience as another human being, or I'm sorry, you can have the same event happen as another human being, but have a completely different experience. And it could be just the angle you saw it through. It could purely just be uh, the environment that you're in, how you were raised, your subconscious, all of these things really shape how you see an event. And so I think it's important for us to remember that just because we didn't have major trauma, I would say that I did not have major trauma. I mean, I was bullied in school, um, but I didn't have major trauma, but I still had really hard things that made my brain confused. It made me feel unsafe. It made me really struggle with anxiety um and so that's okay you know that that's okay that that's the way that was it's okay that I have really good parents that were also imperfect it's 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 okay you know and I think sometimes we need to hear that if you're listening to this and you're like you know this is not my parents fault you know I was there I was defending my parents because I I they are good people you know they are good parents Uh, but that doesn't mean they did everything right. And I don't sit here on the other side of this podcast episode, uh, thinking to myself that I'm doing everything right as a parent. I'm actually thinking I need to get my kids counseling fund (laughs) put together, um, because I think they're going to need it. And how I look at this, um, with trauma is we are, as parents, we are, basically running this race for the future generations. I give this analogy often where we are on a team, right? We're racing as a team and I have just been past the baton. I'm holding it and now it's my turn to run the race my way, right? And hopefully when I pass that baton on to the next generation, so my kids, hopefully they are going to work on even more trauma and breaking that. 
And they're going to break these generational patterns. It's not going to happen with you alone. It's going to happen with generation, generation, generation. And that for me kind of takes the weight off. Because yep, I feel rage. Yes, I feel these intense feelings. And I feel like I'm ruining my kids in the moment. But if I look at it as me doing better than my parents did in some way, right? Like if I can look at it in that way, I can say, all right, I am making some progress. And I hope that the progress that I am making invites my kids into curiosity, invites my kids into wanting to do better and parenting their kids uh, and hopefully um, breaking the cycles that the generations before us had created. Uh, so let's make that forward motion movement, you know, let's let's start moving the wheel forward and giving our kids that foundation uh, to really jump off of. And so when we're thinking about trauma, you know, we're thinking about it being stored. I love the book, The Body Keeps Score. Uh, that's a great one. Um, there's a couple other books I haven't read that Irene Lyon had uh, recommended. They're on my list. Uh, but it, they all talk about how the body stores our stress and our trauma. And I I think that for so many of us, we liked to to think because it's easier to think that our rage is because of our kids or it's because of something going on right now and it's not you know it's always I say always most of the time it's something in our past it's something from our childhood from our subconscious um, and it's it's bringing up those same feelings and emotions that we experienced at that time of trauma And I will share, you know, a little personal story. I would get really raged when my kids would be crying and I couldn't get them to stop. And I'm telling you, I mean, I was in counseling at the time and everything. I'd been in counseling for probably five years already. And I would say to my counselor, but every single time she reaches this octave, it was like, it didn't matter, I mean, and it was with both my kids, uh, it would be a certain octave, a certain level of cry that would send me into a disarray. I'd have to wake my husband up. I would, I, I couldn't do it. It would make my body physically feel so uncomfortable. Like I couldn't even hold my baby. And um, it, it was scary. You know, it was really, really scary. And so I, I can feel my body tensing right now because of, of just, oh, what the, the feeling and the experience is just, oh, it's awful. Um, if you're on YouTube, you can probably tell my body has shifted and changed. and That's okay. <laughs> this is the body kind of retelling and, and experiencing this again. And, and maybe it's, it's going to uh, help me to kind of process through some of it. But I had four years in been talking to my counselor about it and we, we've been trying to kind of get down to why is this happening you know what are the patterns and we thought it was because of the NICU we thought that, that had a lot to do with it and then one day I said to her I said something about me being a baby and me crying all the time and she goes you cried all the time and I said yeah for like the first three months all I did was cry my mom said all I did was cry and she's like that is so interesting so we started talking about that experience and how hard that must have been for me as a baby you know I had all these needs and and for some reason it wasn't getting met you know I don't don't I you know I didn't know then what was going on so I actually had a conversation with my mom and I said you know hey mom like I when I was a baby and I was crying and crying and crying what was going on and she's like well you know you were five weeks early I couldn't get you to latch well and I think you were really hungry. You know, I, I tried all the things the doctor was telling me to do and you just were always upset and fussy and you seemed like you were gassy and uncomfortable and I was jaundiced and I was in the hospital for that for a little while and I just, I, I think I was a hot mess. <laughs> and it made so much sense to me because I get hangry now. I get really hangry. Uh, but that octave, you know, remember I mentioned the octave that I would start feeling like, oh, I can't, this is so uncomfortable. That was the octave I would get to when I was like at my at my end, my end rope, right? As a baby. My primal response was to scream out to try to get the attention of my mom and dad to give me more food. I'm starving. I'm hungry. Feed me. <laughs> 
But as a baby, that's my communication, right? And so imagine as an adult, I mean, clearly, I, how would I have known unless I talked to my mom that that was my experience as a baby? I wouldn't have, right? But my body was storing that from the time I was born. And so it started to make so much sense to me that these underlying traumas are things that we need to begin uncovering. And I want you to think and I want you to to remember as I'm telling this story, I figured this out four years in. I was in counseling for four years before we discovered that this was it. And, And that's kind of where I talk about it's the layers and the puzzle pieces coming together to help our brains make sense. And the minute it started to make sense, I knew that I needed to start comforting myself. I needed to give myself the love and the touch that I needed, the comfort that I needed when I was that little baby that was so hungry and she didn't know how to communicate that to mom. She didn't know how to communicate that she wasn't getting enough milk or that the milk, you know, she was getting just was not satisfying her I didn't I I didn't know how to do that as a baby (laughs) because how would I right my mom didn't understand what I was screaming for and I think that so many of us have these kinds of experiences and I think that it's totally a hundred percent normal to uh, have a process to have a journey to understanding what's going on and so I don't want you to listen to my story and be like oh I should know what it is and I you know or I've discovered what it is you know for the longest time like I said I thought it was my NICU experiences with my babies but it wasn't you know and so how can I uncover the pieces how can I put the pieces together um, that's really what I do with coaching as well you know I help parents to you know, look at, look at their world from a different perspective. I use this analogy often, but I imagine that I am on the outside of a snow globe looking into your world and it's all snowy and you can't see, you can't see around you. Um, it's really hard for you to see all that's going on when it's kind of blurry. But for me, because I'm on the outside and I'm kind of up above, it's a lot less blurry for me to see what's going on in your world. And so, I think it's important that we have people in our life who can help us through these things to help us see the things that maybe don't seem so clear to us. So yeah, when we're thinking about trauma, underlying trauma, you know, what are some ways that you can begin being curious about it? You know, journaling, that's a huge way, uh, you know, especially reflecting on a moment when you're feeling really upset, anxious, ragey, um, doing things like somatics helps to begin kind of shaking up, loosening up that trauma. For me, chiropractic care was really, really helpful. Um, it's a very emotional experience at times. Um, and then of course, counseling and coaching and things like that can also be very helpful in helping you to understand your trauma and also just figure it out. If you're somebody that's like, I have no idea what my trauma is, that would probably be a really good idea for you to look into coaching, look into counseling. Uh, Because as I mentioned before, both those things work hand in hand. They're not something that one is better than the other. Uh, They really have two different beautiful purposes. And when they're used together, my goodness, it's beautiful. But the next thing that I actually want to talk about, we're going to, we're going to shift gears here is kind of go a health route and this is again part of my own story but I found that mom rage was linked to my liver. I was born with high bilirubin. Uh, The doctors didn't really know why. I've always had high bilirubin my whole life. Uh, My dad ended up finding out he has had high bilirubin his whole life and then my grandpa also has high bilirubin. So it's something genetic and I knew that, um, but I got some testing done a couple of years ago uh, while I was pregnant with my second and the genetic testing came back and told me I have a rare gene called the PEMT gene, which basically makes it really hard for the liver to break down choline. I think think that's how you say that, choline, choline, whatever. Um, You guys get what I'm saying, the supplement uh, you can take for choline and I, I could not break that down and it was interesting because I craved eggs when I was pregnant with my kids. I craved uh, anything that had choline in it 
So when I began looking into this after I had gotten that diagnosis, um, or I, I don't want to call it a diagnosis, once I had gained an understanding of my genes, I started looking into liver, into the liver and understanding that our body stores anger there. And if we look into things like German New Medicine, we see that the liver gets activated and really struggles uh, when we are having anger issues um they call it like an anger conflict something you could look into if you're interested um resonates with some not with others uh but when i looked into uh how choline deficiencies affect the body what i learned that there were things like anxiety and mood swings that were causing me so much distress And I think that all of those symptoms were what led to the rage, right? And it was as simple as me getting a supplement to help me keep me regulated because it was just my body screaming for an essential nutrient that it was not breaking down. So I think that it's important that we also look into the health side of things, get things checked out, make sure that everything is all good, um, you know, make sure that our bodies are taking in the nutrients, you know, correctly. For me, my liver just does not break down choline well. And so I need to make sure I have enough copper and I have enough choline and I also have enough folate, which I didn't uh, realize that I was also deficient in. And so all of those things just kind of make this really bad storm for me to have anger and to feel really angry. So Now I ensure that I take my uh, supplements and then I've also been introducing, reintroducing because I did them for like two years straight and then kind of fell off the wagon. But I've been reintroducing my adrenal cocktails. Uh, If you don't know what those are, I'll link a recipe below. Maybe I should like put it on my blog and link that. Maybe I'll get to that. (laughs) Who knows? Um, But anyway, doing those kinds of things, regulating the body through food is huge. And as I mentioned earlier, I am definitely somebody who gets hangry. And so making sure that I'm eating consistently, somebody commented on one of my YouTube videos. Um, if this was you, you should comment below. <laughs> but they were like, it's a totally brand new thing when someone else says it like, meet your basic needs and just eat, you know, like, and it's so true because when I first heard that, I was like, oh my gosh, that's genius. Like I need to like eat. (laughs) And it's like, it's just a basic need that I need to do every single day, you know? So making sure you're eating consistently, making sure you're filling your body with mostly nourishing foods, you know, and, and figuring out what that looks like for you. For me, I need quite a bit of eggs. I really need eggs in the morning. Pretty much don't go a day without eggs. Um, (laughs) because makes me angry. Um, So yeah, really figuring out what works for you and what works for your body. And I think that's part of the journey, right? Figuring out you and what your needs are, uh, whether that's in health or it's just mentally, emotionally, and being really open and okay that your journey and your uh, lifestyle is going to look different than mine and the next person. And that's okay. That's actually really good. It makes it unique to you and I think it's a beautiful thing to teach our kids that we are so aware of what we need and how we need that done Uh, and yeah just opens up I think a world for us to model and for our kids to learn and understand how to handle things when they come at them. So the next thing that I find a lot of mamas struggle with is just identifying their trigger. Like I mentioned earlier, in the very beginning stages of understanding my trigger, I thought it was my NICU experience with my girls. I was unable to hold them, you know, once we were in the NICU and all of that. Um, My first daughter, I didn't get to hold it all until it was over 24 hours after My second daughter, I got to hold her for the first two days, but then she went to the NICU and I was watching them put PICU lines in, PICU lines, PIC lines, (laughs) PICU is where she was for a while. (laughs) She wasn't in the NICU, she was actually in the PICU because of her heart. Um, But anyway, they uh, were putting PIC lines in and different IV things and I, I saw way too much stuff that no parent should ever have to see and so I really thought that that was what was triggering me and rightfully so right like I'm standing there watching my child get this pick line put in 
And I just want to scream and rip the cords out of her. I mean, my husband had to hold me back at one point when we had first seen her um, after they had finally got everything all in. I just wanted to rip everything off. It was like this instinctual, just like, oh, like it's so frustrating. Um, And so, yeah, I, I think that that was what I really thought and what made sense to me was like, when my babies start crying, like I said, that was what I knew was my trigger, but I didn't know why that was triggering me. And like I said earlier, I thought it was the NICU. But once I identified, okay, it's the the crying at this octave. It's when I can't soothe this baby. I was like, make sense. NICU, I couldn't, you know, soothe my babies. But then as I started uncovering the layers and understanding that this was like something in my body, right? It was so, I, I don't know how to explain it. It was like out of body. Uh, if you have mom rage in this way, I'm sure you understand what I'm saying. Um, but it's like when I discovered that's what it was, that's what started to lead me down the road of, well, what was my experience like? And really allowing ourselves to get to a point where we can be open and willing to dig even deeper. I think that there is constantly deeper, 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 deeper we can go. I don't think we're ever going to discover it all. But I think that we can get to a point where we feel closure, where we can get back into a very calm, uh, parasympathetic state once we understand the why, once we understand why do I do this, you know? Um, and you'll feel it in your body. You'll just, you'll know. And trust me when I say this, you'll know. Like you will think you know and you'll keep thinking you know. Like I did, I kept thinking it's the NICU and then all of a sudden when I heard it from my mom, it was like this clunk in my body. It was like, oh, I can feel it in my soul. This is exactly what it is. So being open to that, being willing to look and continue digging and discovering for that, uh, I think is, is really important. So another reason why you can't stop raging is because you're overwhelmed, you're burned out, and you're tired. Okay, now what I'm about to say is from personal experience, but when I get more sleep, I'm not as ragey. (laughs) If you're relating with this, like give this video a thumbs up. Um... Because yeah, it's true. Uh, Us moms don't get enough sleep. And truthfully, we are expected to thrive off very little sleep. And that is just not the case. And that was a lot of the reason why I started co-sleeping with my second. Because I wanted to sleep through the night. Because I was miserable the next day. I was a horrible human being. Uh, And so I think that that process of starting to co-sleep, doing the safe sleep seven and, you know, all of that really taught me that I need to prioritize what is important to me and what my needs are. I need to prioritize those things so that I can show up with love and compassion and empathy even in the moments when I'm triggered and things get really, really hard. I know how hard it is to stay on track and I think that that was and it still is part of the struggle for me and why mom rage will resurface because I'll get out of my habit and that's actually I recently did a video where I for the very first time shared my habits daily journal Uh, but I started doing These little mini habits, focusing on three a week, nothing crazy, uh, but focusing on three a week that I could easily do and that I knew that I could accomplish. So I could show myself and prove to myself that I could continue in these habits. So if you're interested in starting a habits journal, you can absolutely start this on a piece of paper. This was the way I started. I just started doing it in my journal. Um, But I do have a free download. If you're interested in it, um, you can comment on YouTube and uh, just comment habit and I will send that to you. And if you are on the podcast, you can uh, hit the link in the description. Um, you'll see it'll say habit free habit daily journal and you can click there and download it there. But I think that it's just it's so important for us to just get into these little mini habits that help to move us towards our goal. 
because for me with mom rage I can when it gets really bad I can go into like I need to fix everything and that's actually not helpful because it makes me feel more overwhelmed and more burned out and when I'm already overwhelmed and I'm burned out and I'm tired I need very simple actionable things and so typically and honestly some weeks overlap and some weeks um take the same habits for like five weeks in a row. Um, but it could look like, you know, going to sleep at 10 p.m. or, you know, before 10 p.m. and drinking my adrenal cocktail and taking my choline supplement. Like those are literally my habits for this month. <laughs> so that way I can stay on track. So I can be the best version of myself or at least set myself up for success. So it doesn't mean I'm necessarily going to choose success because it's really, really hard for somebody who has uh, consistently uh, shown that how I'm going to respond in this moment is through rage, right? But we can set ourselves up for success by doing things that help us to move in that direction. So I hope that that was helpful with the journal. Um, I know it's hard to kind of explain it over podcast episode, but that's why I decided to make a printable because I think so many moms are going to benefit from it. So download that and hopefully that'll kind of help keep you on track. All right, the next thing is you are feeling stuck in fight and flight. So when I was first in chiropractic care, I became keenly aware that I was so anxious that I had never experienced calm because immediately after I would be adjusted, I would feel calm for two to three minutes. And I was like, I have never experienced this before. I thought there were moments in my life where I had been calm, but I just believed that I was just a high strung person. And that is not true. <laughs> I was stuck in fight or flight. And that was what was driving a lot of my mom rage. It was that I was just constantly in this heightened state and I had never allowed myself the time just to be. And so that's really where I started integrating slow living. Um, if you're new to slow living, I have an entire playlist uh, that shares a lot of the slow living -y things. Not necessarily every uh, video is titled slow living, but it, it gives really the, the basics and the premise of how I've begun to integrate uh, slow living into my life. I also did a YouTube video all about how to start slow living for beginners who are moms specifically. Uh, so you can check that out as well. But I think that we need to focus on our nervous system. We need to focus on where our bodies are at, where our nervous system is at. And I think another key, another key point here is allowing our, our environment to nurture that part of the nervous system that needs nurturing. You know, if we are constantly up here heightened all the time, it's like, how can I add in little moments of calm or slow so that I can experience a parasympathetic state. So I know what that feels like, you know. Another great way to do this, like I mentioned earlier, is somatics. I love the workout, which I'm going to link her stuff below. I am an affiliate, which means you'll give me like a half a latte, maybe, if you purchase it. <laughs> um, but I did not... Um, she did not ask me to be an affiliate. I found her and I reached out to her um, because I just absolutely have had a life-changing experience with somatics. Um, so yeah, really focus on that. If you would like more research, research, yeah, there's, that's research. <laughs> if you would like more resources is what I was trying to say uh, on the nervous system, Irene Lyon is going to be the person to go to. I will make sure to link her stuff below as well. So you can go check all of that out. Allow your body to, to see and to explore and to research what feels good and right for your body right now. But if something starts feeling too uncomfortable, it's okay to, to take a step back. It's okay to kind of just let it sit there for when your body feels ready for it. And I can tell you every single time that my body becomes ready, it's like literal food to my soul. Like it, it's just, it's so soothing. It's like, honey, 
it's just so sweet and it's amazing and uh, it feels, feels and it tastes so good. So if any of this information feels like too much, it's okay to put it on a back burner, to put a little tack in it for later. Totally okay and totally normal. Okay, the very last thing that I think moms struggle with mom rage, why they still rage, they just haven't found a calming tool that works for them. I hear of so many basic calming tools, things like, oh, just try deep breathing, um, go for a walk, uh, read a book, you know, like these things that I just are not, log- they're not easy. They're, I wouldn't say logical. It's not what I meant. They're not easy. They're not necessarily something that works for everybody. They're not that simple. Uh, things like running your hands under cold water, uh, shaking your body out, moving your lymph nodes, uh, you know, go, doing uh, your lymphatic system, uh, which I, I can't even really describe to you. I could give you some resources. If I'm editing this and I'm thinking, oh yeah, I can think of an awesome resource off the top of my head, I will link it below. But if not, go do some research on um, just your lymphatic system and how to kind of get that moving. Um, but doing things that are actually going to help you. A- another thing that's really helpful Irene Lyon talks a ton about um, releasing anger. She has some different exercises and stuff that you can do, which are awesome. But with exercises, things like actually physically getting the anger out, something like hitting the bed with a pillow, throwing a pillow on the floor, something that actually removes that anger is so awesome, so cool uh, for the body because it it just, it ha- kind of shakes everything up. It allows you to take that energy and actually throw it and put it somewhere versus taking it and keeping it inside. So this was a very long podcast episode. <laughs> I've been really enjoying talking about this. This is obviously something that's very near and dear to my heart. If you have any questions, if you are struggling with mom rage and you're like, I just, I desperately just need help. You just need somebody to vent to. That is what my inbox is for. Um, you can always email me at alexis at slowishparenting.com. And I love listening to you guys. I love reading these things, even though they're hard to read sometimes, but I love reading them because I know exactly where you're at. I know exactly how you're feeling. And I just want to give you the encouragement that you can move past this. You can be the mom that you want to be. You're not stuck. You're not always going to be in fight or flight, especially when you're working and you want to be better than that. You want to do better. You want to find the absolute joy and happiness in your life. And you deserve that. You absolutely do. And if nobody's told you today, you are a beautiful and a good mama, no matter how rage-filled you feel at times. So I hope that encourages you. I want to thank you for watching. If you like this video, make sure that you give it a thumbs up. If you're not subscribed on my YouTube channel, or I guess on the podcast in general, uh, make sure that you hit that subscribe button uh, just so you're notified every time. And if you don't want to miss an episode and you're like, I absolutely want to make sure I'm notified, um, I do have my community of mamas with over 7,500 mamas. I cannot believe (laughs) I'm over 7,500. I think I'm actually close to 8,000. But anyway, it's kind of crazy that the community has grown that much. Uh, But if you want to join those like-minded mamas and make sure that you're notified and get extra little... Uh, emails that really talk about motherhood and having that encouragement come in your inbox two times a week. Um, Definitely sign up for that and I'll leave a link for that below as well. So alrighty guys, thank you so much for watching and happy parenting.